We made them build us an electric, uh, uh, an RC version, yeah. like a remote control car. And they came out, it was a full size car, had this like remote control guy. And uh, he went up and the car fell out of the loop. Oh yeah. And yeah, exploded yeah, yeah. and tires like <laughs> bounced down this. It was like, I don't want that to be Yeah, yeah. Hello? Greg and I just looked <laughs> yeah. at each other and they're like, that's this our is only one. a good idea. <laughs> Hustle. I'm Fastlane Jane. And I'm Design Muse. And today we have Tanner Faust. Woo! Woo! <laughs> All right. So uh, we are pretty excited about this today. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We don't even know how to do this introduction because we've went back and <laughs> he's like, what? We don't. <laughs> There's he's, an introduction. He's a very humble person, but yeah. we went back and forth and just, we were like, there's so many different things that you've done. Um, I mean, as far as being a motorsports person, I mean, oh my gosh. Well, multiple, you know, X Games champion. Right. Right? Just one thing. And then rally cross. M multiple right. times, too. Yeah, like four, right? Uh, I, I, yeah. I have my numbers right. Four and three, and then two we, of this. We were going then, back and forth. There was, was there's just so many things. Uh, uh, Hot Wheels world champion. 322 feet. Three, 332 feet. That was, oh, a, that was a help. Come on. Now, like now right. when I remember, yeah. I that. remember some of the other stuff. But yeah, that yeah. one. Those is last it, 10 feet were scary. Is yeah. that, That's it. Is that a good place for us to start? Though? Oh my gosh. I, well, even that now uh, host of Top Gear. Oh I mean, gosh. multiple times on TV, being different hosts. Uh, Drift King. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny being here because, the, you know, last time I was here, there were some cars from Tokyo Drift from Fast and Furious sitting on the rack here. So it, yep. it, it is kind of a, a memory lane thing. It's it's good to hear that stuff, but it's it, sometimes it seems like somebody else. It's just been a, it's just a long time, you know? Yeah. And um, so I don't really, it doesn't really feel like I've done a lot. I'm just sort of interested in the next thing and, and the right. ball very fortunately has kept rolling. It's, uh, yeah. and that's the nature of this industry. You just sort of keep the ball rolling, keep, keep finding things to do that are fun and, and um, figure out how to stay racing and stay passionate about stuff. And it's amazing, it's gone 25 years, it's crazy. Wow, Yeah, that yeah. is amazing. And I, and I think that's the thing is that, you know, at high octane hustle, I mean, it, in the name itself is exactly that. You, you figure out how to stay racing, how to stay go, doing stuff in motorsports. Like, how can I do the next cool thing, you know? And I think all of us are always like that, like what that is, so is, where you started, do you feel yourself like has that changed as it's kind of, it sounds like it's evolved a lot. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to uh, sound too clueless, but I was clueless, 100% getting into racing. I didn't have anybody, it, you guys both come from Mary's where you had like racing in the family or you knew racers. Liked or cars. Or you still do. Liked cars. I liked yeah. cars. Yeah. I didn't know motorsport. Yeah. I wasn't a motorsport fan. I didn't watch racing. I didn't go to races. My dad was a gynecologist. I didn't have, like, the racing thing. Yeah. And so I didn't understand what it was about. And so it was always, from ground zero, um, had to be a job. It had to be a business. There had to be a professional aspect to it Yeah. Um, from the beginning. Do you think that inventor that you worked for played a role and can you kind of share with our audience what that role was and who that was? Yeah, that was, so I was in college in Boulder and, um, which means I smoked pot. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you hear, heard it here. Yeah. There's a weed, <laughs> didn't there's, inhale. There's a weed store next door <laughs> to our undisclosed location. I could smell it when I walked in actually. I was like, oh, it's this kind of podcast. Okay. <laughs> wow. We got a snort in minute three. Stop the clock. I know there's some sort of betting pool going, isn't there? Yeah. Um, but it happens. Yeah. It was, uh, Boulder's a great town. And, um, I, 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 I dropped out of school for two years though. And, uh, in my hiatus out of school, I was a bus driver in Vail. I did some random thing. I was a ski bum for a while. And then I came back. I knew I had to get back in Boulder if I was ever going to finish school. Mm. And so I got a job as a, a parking lot attendant guy at a dealership, car dealership, which turned out to be an awesome job. I can just imagine 
how that all went. Oh, I got to if shred cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime there, you get to drive, a lot of these all. all they're all driving. driving. Every job I've ever had, I've worked yeah. at a at a golf club, and and you know, washing the clubs was the main job. Okay. But learning how to do 360s on the driving range was really <laughs> why I was there. And so, is this in the golf carts? In the or golf in the carts. Cluster? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got. I did get fired from the bus driving job for doing donuts in the <laughs> Beaver Creek West lot. <laughs> Which was uh, awesome. That was actually really good times. Yeah, I see um, the pattern going here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, burned a couple bridges. But the, uh, yeah, the inventor, I sold a car. So I was a lot parking lot guy. The manager of the dealership was like, hey, you seem to know a lot about these cars. Why don't we just have a couple customers talk to you about them and then you send them into a sales guy or whatever. And so... I never like close. I wasn't like a closer, but I would talk to people about the cars, and then yeah. and they would maybe feel the passion or whatever. I don't know, and 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 ended up doing well with that. But I met a guy there whose dad was an inventor. I ended up going to work for him. He invented amusement rides. He was the first person I'd ever met who was like an entrepreneur. Yeah, you know, because I was in school to be a doctor. Everything was very much about go through school, go to yep. grad school, med school, residency, nine to five. It you know yep. or, you know whatever. But, um, yeah, an entrepreneur is weird. He liked skydiving, and so he invented a ride that simulated what skydiving felt like and then oh, made wow. a living at that. And it was like, that's insane to me. So the most fun things I knew how to do, I liked skiing and driving. Um, my dad was a skier. I knew a little bit about that business, and it, it's not an, it, it didn't seem like an easy business to get into. Maybe I was too lazy from all the smoking a pot. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but the, um, but driving, uh, was a really core passion. Like right. I, when I was six, I could, I could name any car by its headlights, you know, which drove my sister crazy. But I was, I was always about cars my whole life for sure. And, um, so after working for that guy, I started trying to piece together maybe how, how, you know, you could drive or make a living with the steering wheel anyway. Yeah. It's cool. Like people like that in our path start to inspire us in a certain way. Like you said, you're. It was already kind of headed there because you just love driving and just anytime you can get behind the wheel, it just would happen, you know? So, um, it's yeah. interesting to see that, but the entrepreneur part, like I, that's a great segue into like you, you are a businessman. You really are. You know, I mean, you've done it, you've made, you know, like you said, 25 years you've been doing this, you know? And yeah. like, how did you see that kind of change going from that into like you said, what what were what were the things he was kind of helping you with, or your ideas that went from there? I think, um, you know, Bill Kitchen was his name. Still friends. He, like, you could throw a frisbee at him and it would bounce off his forehead. Like it wasn't <laughs> like there were certain things he didn't have skill at, but you gave him ten bucks and he'd make it ten thousand in a mm. week. And he just had this fearlessness. And it's like, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. I mean, it's just money. It's not like they're taking an, a limb or something. And this fearlessness, and I think a lot of times people are held back by their 16-year-old dream because they're afraid of letting go of yep. whatever it is, stability, uh, you know, whatever it is that they currently feel like they have. And what they have may be unhappiness. So it's like, why not let that go? Yeah. But um, that was probably the number one thing is watching just if he got an idea, he'd even listen to a conversation about with somebody and think, wow, that's a really good idea. And then a week later, he'd have the you know, the game going hmm. on how to make money on that idea. And it would, and he would have spent money to do it and risk things and gotten rid of stuff that I knew that he really loved, you know, whatever it was, he risked yeah. stuff for the belief. And that's powerful to kind of, it's contagious uh, when right. you're around somebody like that. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's what, but then there's also a lot of dominoes that have to fall in just the right direction. Got I sat on a ski lift with, um, somebody who had been involved in Formula One in the past, and he gave me a couple clues. Cool. And then I, I saw a racetrack from the airplane when I, when I was working for the inventor, Bill, and, and went back to Colorado. Uh, and I drove up to that racetrack, and I walked up to the racetrack, and, and then a guy came and told me I just can't stand there. Ended up striking up a conversation with that guy, and I um, ended up volunteering as a mechanic on his team. He had a customer kind of arrive and drive thing with spec Fords and formula Mazdas, which is like club racing SCCA. Mm -hmm. And so I volunteered as a mechanic in return for some seat time in the cars. And it was a, a long road. It was eight months of 
volunteering to get one race and a license out of it. But the things we do, huh? For oh, some seat time. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's well, I expensive. think anything <laughs> worth doing or worth having, you it doesn't happen overnight. And I think yeah. that what everybody sees with Tanner Faust, the brand, is the meat and potatoes, the end result. And I think, how'd you get to be such a badass and learning about that? Um, that's, you got to put the work that, in. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people, you know, uh, understanding that. It feels like you, you have understood that the whole time, like that you have to put extra work in all the time and still now yeah i i mean i would i hate to say this but <laughs> while i work 18 hour days sometimes and in my past i mean i've i've done i've seen sunrise twice in a work day i think i'm kind of lazy and this is terrible <laughs> This is terrible because I understand I'm sorry. that though. Well, because the kind of work that I do is yeah. stuff that I love to do. Yeah. And so it never feels like work. It feels yep. like there's not enough hours in the day. Yeah. And the um it, for Bill, for the inventor, I I built architectural models oh. for him that were like concepts. That was towards the end of working for him. Kind of little little models to show patent attorneys or for him to use to sell the concept to amusement parks, stuff like that. And I had to go, you know, the hobby stores and hardware stores and come up. And I really liked that side of it. And so I would, I'd forget to eat all day, forget to sleep. I mean, I just, you just get into it. So it doesn't yeah. actually feel like work. In yeah. hindsight, yeah, you can say, oh, there's a lot of hard work. But right. I don't know. It just, it, it, it was interesting. And it's the same with cars. There, there have... Uh, I've done things that felt like work with cars, yeah. but I've been fortunate enough to get enough things on the plate that when something starts to feel like work, I can kind of get it out of the schedule. And, and I mean, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Right? No, it sounds, no, and it sounds good. Yeah. And yeah. it's perfect. And, and I guess I like, like that you're articulating that because yes, I say put the work in, but maybe there's a different way to explain it because put the time it's, and the it's energy the time because you've mentioned before too, like you're always growing. Yeah. Okay, you're always learning. Yes. So it's the same type of thing. You're not afraid to like, oh, this is it. Like, I'm done. And it was easy. It's like, it's not easy. It's something that you, I don't want to say work at. <laughs> well, you have something to. Something you learn, I guess. It's a, per, there's a, you know. The personality side of it is you need to revel in the mistakes. Like, from a racing That's standpoint, good, yeah. you, you gain a lot more from losing than you do from winning. And. You may gain some job security by winning, but personally, skill level wise, mastery of whatever and drive, you gain a lot more from losing. And you yeah. and so the whole process, you sort of have to revel in the learning process, not the end game. To your yeah. point, it's not about the end game. So the personality, you need to be somebody who loves the learning part of it. Yeah. And I still do things and I've been with companies that will take advantage of this, but I still do things that I charge x number four but i 100 percent would do it for free yeah and that's how it started out that's how it is still now um at some point you have to find the value that you can provide for a company and then put a number on that so that you can afford to live but um as long as you would do it for free it's it's not work yeah no i and, and that's a great point and and it sounds like that some of that came from uh you know the inventor that you know that he really helped get you in that mindset and everything too. Yeah. I watched him do some deals like six flags, you know, the amusement parks. Oh, I wow. remember he had a deal. His, his ride was the sky coaster. So it was a big arch. You got pulled back. You're in hang gliding harnesses. You pulled a rip cord and you'd swing through it. Oh, cool. It wasn't like bungee, but it was like a giant swing set. Yeah. And, um, very simple, not very many moving parts, super safe liability insurance, less than a, a merry-go-round. I mean, I know the whole <laughs> spiel for the whole thing, but Watching that go from, you know, a, a napkin drawing to, you know, a couple hundred million dollars and how it, sometimes it was a phone call. And I was in the room with him when he was with Six Flags and they, they ordered six and he put them on hold. And he said, hey, we have a little bit of a manufacturing thing. Metal steel is different than it was now. And he and, you know, he's it was like a movie is where he's like talking to me about, oh, I, I need I want to get some wheels for that car. Where, what do you think I should get for it and stuff? And then he's like, hold on a sec. Yeah, it's going to be one hundred and twenty five thousand extra per ride, you know. <laughs> and and, and so he just made half a million dollars just in like 
just being opportunistic. He, and and yeah. I watched how he, you know, you have a lawyer and you think when you have a lawyer for something, they're the ones feeding you the information on what to do. Mm-hmm. People who are CEOs and who are really in that business mindset, they're the ones using the lawyer to put into legalese what they want to do. Yep. And um, he really controlled all of that. And, and it was it's fascinating to watch that mastery of that little niche. I mean, it's a small business. Yeah. And, but um, watch how that was the work that led him decide what to do with the rest of the day. And I love that. It, it, and it translates. It doesn't mean you just need to be a skydiver inventing an amusement park ride. It's right. that thought process that you were exposed to that. I love that. hundred percent. And in racing, it's the same thing. Yeah. I, you know, every contract you get is by nature, it's one sided. Yeah. So it's always right. about being able to understand what everybody's motivation is, understanding yes. the balance. This is what drivers and business people in motorsport don't quite get. And that's why you get agents and managers mm-hmm. is understanding really what the value is of what you're doing. So if you're changing, um, for Ford, for example, when I was with them, our, our job behind the scenes was to lower their mean demographic age. So okay. they wanted a younger buyer. The number that a real business person in that world could apply to that is astronomical. The value that how that goes long term in the future of the company and everything is huge. The number that is proposed for your part of that job is pretty small. And so you need an right. agent to say, hey, we're doing a we're moving a needle. That's a pretty valuable needle, you know. And so sometimes you have to have a bad guy in there to do it. Sure. But the understanding of the business and the understanding of the motivations for the driver is important if you're going to keep your job for a long time and, um, and being able to align with companies that, you know, you can help not just give you some money and some, some sticker to put on a car or something like that, you know, which because that never happens for very long. Yeah. No, you need to be able to affect them in a positive way. And if you can't, you've got to let that go because you, you, you need to make room to do bandwidth not room on the car really just bandwidth for yourself to work with companies that you can actually positively change their business yeah well i mean even going into that a rock star is someone that you've worked with for a long time right like how did that start out in in keeping that relationship too yeah it's done now um but uh no i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, it was it was 18 years. Yeah, I mean that's wow. a lot, but that's yeah, a long, long term. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it so was it's great. Been my energy drink of choice. Yeah, Rockstar. Rockstar fruit punch Mine zero. Too. There oh. you go. I like it. <laughs> it's a it's a tough business. Yeah. And um, I got involved with them. They didn't have a motorsport department. They had six employees, and oh, wow. they were uh, in music. That, that was kind of how they did it. They did sampling at concerts. That was sort of their thing. They're breaking in. Russ was the guy who owned the company. And we did X Games. Uh, Rally Car got into X Games. I joined um, a Subaru team. There were four of us. It was Travis Pastrana, Ken Block, and Colin McRae. And mm-hmm. Colin McRae was somebody who I did see as a kid, watch yeah. videos of him. He was a He's probably the only person I met where I got starstruck. And... Uh, and then myself and, and we had a great time doing the thing. And, uh, I took Colin out and drove him around in my drift car in a weird day at Irwindale with Hulk Hogan and Nick Hogan. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. It was Hulk very Hulk random. Funny. Yeah. It, didn't, it went, it was an interesting week. Um, like this is a little surreal yeah. right now, but you know, <laughs> but for rockstar, they were like, yeah, X games. Sure. Let's do it. I mean, this was an inexpensive way to get a big banner. They had some dirt bike guys, but that was just a little helmet. Yeah. And here you had a whole car, you know, it's a yeah. huge banner for them. Yeah. And they had no relationship with car manufacturers. And, and so for me, my, I, I never was really, uh, their typical rock star sponsored athlete. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, I was maybe a bit older. I didn't ride dirt bikes. I, I did, um, you know, it's more into flying than I was into other things. And, you know, it, it was just that I always had a car manufacturer relationship. Okay. And so for them, they couldn't buy their way into a Ford or a Volkswagen or a Toyota. Yeah. But I went through the years with all of those companies and they got cross promotional stuff, gave sure. away cars on cans. They did all kinds of interesting stuff, building their value through that relationship. So for them, I was more of a networking center. And, and is that that's how where you marketed yourself too to them? Yes. Kind of? Yeah. And you yeah. knew that. I okay. mean, we pushed, when we started, yeah. they were like, awesome. Racing is cool. So <laughs> let's do like a, 
what's the next thing? We're doing like a Lamborghini or something? I was like, oh, well, actually a Ford Focus. It's going to be great. <laughs> that was at the top of their list, yeah. right? I'm sorry, what? Yeah. And then they're like, then I, I was moving from Ford to Volkswagen, and they're like, oh, Volkswagen has like Porsche too, right? So we could do like a GT3. And I was like, how about a Beetle? This is going <laughs> to be great. And so, yeah, they never understood that. So I, they just knew that Rallycross brought in a, a good demographic. Yeah. They got live Sunday afternoon TV, sometimes outrated the NASCAR yeah. show almost always outrated the indie car stuff yeah. and the number they were paying compared to those other yeah and you were was, making this focus and this beetle really freaking cool they were, <laughs> By the they were, that you were amazing doing cars with it. and on top of it like you said moving the needle because now you've introduced something a sport that you and i would have easily tried to do right get in those cars and oh, yeah. wheel them around and of course we would <laughs> yes, you would have. And, and we didn't need to be a sponsored driver <laughs> by Rockstar. You're funny. It was but a, totally. It made anyway, it approachable. Hey, we're just like it. We just want to get behind the wheel. Oh my god. Whatever costs that know. is, it doesn't matter. Yes. I know. That's where <laughs> so I'm yes. at too. I always felt that way. But then, the cost. I mean, that's why yeah. Rallycross is not in X Games now. Still, it's just yeah. the cost of doing it. It was, you know, we were spending well over. A million close to two million per car yeah. per summer yeah to drive a beetle around in the dirt and it was you know at some point it didn't it, it didn't add up yeah. compared to carrying a skateboard to <laughs> x God. games or, and getting similar yeah. ratings you know sure. so or sure. I just went to the X Games in Ventura, and they're on bicycles and skateboards. And that's right, and they don't yeah. have motored yeah. stuff anymore. I love it's that they're back in LA though. Sad, yeah, that's, but yeah. Yeah, it's th- still really fun. It is really fun. You're doing stuff with bicycles that, how yeah. many times are you flipping? <laughs> what? I mean, X You're Games, going forward yeah. flipping? X Games crazy. Was, yes. <laughs> yeah. But X Games was one of those dominoes that had to fall in the right way. And it was yeah. the right timing with Rally going to, to X Games and X Games doing what it does, which is shine a huge spotlight on a sport for mainstream to see and convince people to go out of their comfort box and break records and right, and those yeah. guys doing yeah the three front flips and the i mean i was in the room when travis did his first double back and it was i was standing with colin mccray and we both lost our freaking minds <laughs> we almost jumped off the balcony it was and the the room erupted and yeah. then i talked to people the next day who said they were on a front remember frontier was the only airline that yes. had uh, tvs <laughs> yeah in the things they were on a frontier plane and the whole plane erupted wow yeah oh just gosh. over wisconsin somewhere so it's wow. just like i mean it's incredible how yeah. the reach that sometimes these things have and x games really brought rallycross and certainly our brands i mean ken and travis and colin had been on bigger stages i had not mm-hmm. and so brought my I, I guess it, it exposed me to so many more people, and, and, and that's good. So back up from that stage, because nobody makes the leap from working for an inventor to hopping on the rallycross <laughs> stage. There's a There's big, so many pieces, yeah. big bit of time that... Well, there is. I'd well, like to you say do that? I'd like to say I inherited three million dollars and I just <laughs> spent it all because it would be so much easier. But how do you go from doing donuts in a bus to becoming a, a lot of world learning? champion? Yeah, it's a lot of learning. Some bullshit, honestly. I like it. Yeah. yeah and there was. Uh, I went back to Boulder, got my degree, and in uh, biology, guys. In biology, and then stay in school. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> And, and, you know, I, my, of course, my family thought I was going straight to med school after that and stuff. And <laughs> I looked at the MCATs and was just like, there's no freaking way that's going to happen. I put down the bong and then, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was over by then. But, um, but it was, uh, let's see, I got that job with Rich Dahl and Eurosport Racing, which was a local team in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, I go, oh, I got a job. I realized how much money it all costs. So I got a right. job at Pikes Peak International Raceway in Fountain, Colorado, just south of Colorado Springs, working with the sales guy selling sponsorship. Mm. And there built a huge Rolodex of sponsors. In fact, one of the first sales that I had was yeah. with Optima Batteries, who's my title sponsor now. Wow. 
Awesome. Um, 25 plus years later. So right. it, I learned the value of creating relationships. Yes. Yes. Learned and that. that is across the board. 100%. For anything. Yeah. You oh, the, oh, the gosh. person who is yeah. just your contact at the company now, 20 years from now, will be running the company. Right. So, yeah, yeah it's always about maintaining those relationships, yeah. not burning bridges. Yep. When you talk about Pikes Peak International Raceway, mm-hmm. was Bob Boilo? Yeah. He's yeah, a friend yeah. of mine. Yeah, Bob actually, was actually I, at an Acura dealer at that time. He Really? Yeah, he was a <laughs> service manager, I think, at an Acura dealer. He and Kim were both stunt people here in California, and they were on another friend of mine's, big shout out to Wally Crowder, who is probably on Tokyo Drift with you as a stunt coordinator. Yes. And um, uh, He wasn't a stunt coordinator, but he was on it. But he was on it, yeah. Very full circle here. Yeah, it right? is. It Very is. It's a small circle. world at the end of the <laughs> I mean, day. That's just it really Crazy. is. And the so Good people got that job. Then I went to work for an ice driving school up in Steamboat when I graduated. I'm not familiar with that one yep. either. I moved up, went, went to work for the Bridgestone Winter Driving School. And I had met Kevin Schrantz uh, when I was a mechanic for that uh, club racing deal. He would come in as a driver in these uh, Miata, these Formula, Formula Mazdas, I mean. They were Formula cars. And he hooked me up with the guys up there. Jerry Pearl used to be 50% owner. Now you know Mark Cox, who owns it still. Um, And I got a job with them. I was up there for eight years. And I remember having a conversation with Mark Cox that said he came out to see me race. He says, you know what? If you come teach for me for one season, I will make a better driver out of you. And That's very true. And clearly, clearly, well, ice driving and snow driving or slippery (laughs) surface driving. It just teaches you patience. It teaches you some interesting things that apply in a lot of places. Some some places it doesn't, as I've learned, but it's um, eight years there. Summers, I started doing ride and drives, which I'm not sure if you went down that road road i'm with pdi right now. there you go so. so doing yeah ride and drives was like marketing events yeah, yeah. um and kind of got as far along in that as i could i overcame a lot of things though it's all, all of them again the dominoes are each one of them counts yeah and in that one you know public speaking was my least favorite thing in the world as it is for most people i think when they're you know college age or high school age but after college and, and going and doing, doing these talks in the tent, which you have to do, then that went to doing uh, talks for like Slumberjay, 3,000 people on winter driving, and then um, coming up with stuff for manufacturers to talk about in, the, in their demos. You know, you do these right. demos at these driving yeah. marketing events. And if you subscribe to car magazines and stuff back then, maybe you'd get an invite to come out and do the UDE, which was the ultimate driving experience with BMW or whatever. And then I'd be the guy in the mic talking through it. And um, that really helped get getting through that public speaking thing, yeah. which of course helped out getting into TV later on, which, you know, they're all critical steps. Definitely. Yeah, so while it would be easier to say inherited a bunch of money, went racing. <laughs> It's the, the you learned a lot. The hard the part of it is, yeah, is that it's sort of one of those things where you just have to keep getting closer to the job you want, and everything that you learn in that job prepares you kind of for the next step closer, and they're it, all critical. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good point because you've you've definitely talked about like being well round like you have like a tripod. I, I've heard you mention that, yeah. you know, and it's it's important. Not to in the be- way that you're thinking. <laughs> This just got graphic. I thought I was it's not that kind of I show. I thought I was people. edgy talking right. about smoking pot. <laughs> Jesus. What's your show? You can do whatever right. you like. <laughs> Don't spit your water out though. I know. Right? <laughs> that's worse than snorting. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. So we're starting out here. Uh, definitely. I mean, you have this stunt career, right? You yep. have the um, the TV side of it, right? And then the racing. So being a well-rounded person like that and trying to get to know and understand all of that, it it just helps you be better at what you're doing, a a better entrepreneur, a better, you know, being able to go out there and get behind the wheel more, you know? For sure. And and in hindsight, it can seem like it's all planned out like that. (laughs) But it's, uh, you know, in reality, it's probably driven by insecurity that, while these these racing jobs are only lasting a year, they're easy come, easy go, need to diversify in the industry. At least don't say no. And um, then you do that enough, you start to find some things that you can make a living at. And so, so far we've summarized that I'm lazy and insecure. (laughs) 
And the, uh, <laughs> You've just expanded our yeah, demographic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're He's welcome. A little You've humble, moved, just yeah, a little. Yeah. You've moved our needle. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not with my tripod. <laughs> <laughs> so, but ultimately or? everybody, <laughs> ultimately everybody is, you know, at yeah. some level a little bit lazy and insecure. Totally. And it's. Um, but luckily there was enough passion in cars and in driving and interest in learning business and cars and interest in learning how to do TV and, yeah. and all that stuff to sort of keep it going enough that each of these legs kind of could stand on their own. Um, and eventually one of them will have to, but thankfully still there's kind of the, the three things going on while the TV one, I got a, you know, we all worked real hard on top gear yeah. and that one. And again, our definition of work, but it was yeah. a lot of hours. It was 150 days a year. And so we filmed, uh, that was half the year and it was like 10% of my income and half the year. Yeah. And it was a huge amount of travel and the, um, and so by the end of that, when history and BBC kind of finally had it out with each other, the three of us love doing our stuff and love traveling. We love working together, but at the same time, it was kind of like, a, okay, there's half the year opening up now. Yep. And so it was sort of like an exhale. I thought we probably would go back into something, and we did take a couple swings at things, half swings, I'd say. But we all got a little gun shy by the amount of time I think we put into Top Gear. Yeah. I'm working on a show now, and Rutt still does his things. He he did quite a lot of stuff for Netflix and that, and still does his stuff yeah. for NBC. I, I finally actually met him. Uh, we were doing a... Um, a pilot episode and I was like I've, I've still never met him and that was the first time I actually met him yeah. they're lovely guys I oh, mean yeah, both totally. of them um Adam is just one of the most secret intellects ever and biggest heart ever Rutledge is not um he's <laughs> a uh, no, <laughs> no Rutledge is just as lovable as yeah, you can cool. imagine yeah um and so love those guys dearly so we still do a lot of stuff together yeah. hang out a lot together but in any case, it, it just, they ended up feeding each other. The stunt driving, I would get the jobs because the director maybe knew the racing stuff. Um, the racing, I would maybe get some sponsors over other similar drivers yep. because of maybe the TV stuff and had name recognition. Um, the TV stuff, I mean, actually involved a lot of stunts because with Top Gear, we, did, we didn't have really stunt coordinators on set. So we ended up doing, I did most of their driving and some of the driving for the UK guys. And, cool. and so, but the stunt driving has always kind of also been fun. You could crash on purpose, you know? So it was kind of like, <laughs> it was like a, who doesn't want to do that? Yeah, right. right? <laughs> so who's the stig? Oh, uh, we had two stigs, <laughs> which is not a secret anymore, but uh, one was a guy named Paul Gerard. See, I wasn't paying attention to the, they released the name of the stig. Shame on me. They didn't. Paul did. But, um, what are they going to do? The show's gone. So uh, I figured you were when you said you did the no, driving for the I drove it UK. once. We made sure that when we got the Stig that he wore the same suit that I did because they were thinking logistically, we may have to throw you in the suit a couple times to you know, work out. But turns out that all three hosts had to be standing there while the Stig was there. So that didn't really work oh, out. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, yeah, so Paul did it. And then Matt Johnson, another friend of mine, did did Very some of the cool. villain also and and that was awesome that show of course is legendary and yeah totally um, you know the first the first season it was really produ produced by jeremy clarkson um we did a pilot for nbc that nobody's seen i saw there was somebody offered money for one of the old producers to leak it but it never came out and that was with adam carolla mm. oh wow and um it was, it was for primetime NBC, but when the Knight Rider reboot failed, they were like, yeah, car shows don't work. Oh, so they got rid of that Top Gear show, too. Yeah, And that's got when it. History Channel picked that's, it up. Is this in mm. Knight Rider? Is it really a car show? No, it's not a car well, show. I mean, it's a car. Yeah. yeah. It's a show right. about a car, yes. Yeah. It's not a car show. A talking car. It's not insane. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Doesn't Sean's Tesla talk to him? <laughs> I don't know. It talked to us, I think, too. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I loved the original Knight Rider. Oh, yeah. I no, mean, totally. Yeah, and it's it's about the car, though. It's not about the show. It's about the car. Right. It's about the relationship between it's Kit true. and, you know, David Hasselhoff, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> yeah, there were a couple weird ones back then. Do you remember? Now I'm dating myself, but I think it's called Hardcastle McCormick or Hardcastle and something or other. Can somebody that Google that? Yeah. Okay. I get a thumbs up. He had like, he had a coyote. Did the coyote have a name? It was the coyote, and he okay. would, and the judge. So it was this oh. guy that got like such a bad speeding ticket or something oh, that he's going to jail. Familiar. But the judge says you could go to jail, or you could go like run bad guys off the road that I tell you like who they are, just to <laughs> yes, enact please. some justice <laughs> with this super weird looking coyote. It's like a fiberglass yeah. kit car, yeah, uh, not yeah. named Kit, not to be confused. <laughs> But, and then there was Airwolf. I don't know. It was one of these things oh, where it's yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Airwolf was, was a, yeah. that was Jan Michael Vincent, right? Could or be. something like that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't watch that show. I mean, I still hear the dun, 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 <laughs> right? I mean, when I'm going too fast, I always hear that. That, that was uh, a spinoff of the movie Foxfire from uh, Clint Eastwood. Oh, where oh. he stole the jet. Yes. Terrible green screen stuff, but yes. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't even green screen back then. It was just like you're a, movie a little bit of a movie player. buff too, huh? Or is it a car movies. movie? But yeah, I'm both. I love both. movies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I don't know. Those shows there was always like some hero tech that mm. you know was like the thing that came in and saved the day. I guess you know with Kit and Airwolf and the Coyote. <laughs> Maybe that's what it was. Bunch of. So was that your inspiration too? Watching these shows. Sounds like part of um, it. I, I mean. did. You know, we started a little group unofficially called the Slide Snobs where all these shows and movies, we'd always sit there and critique the slides. Okay. And that how, sounds like a fun game to me. Yeah, <laughs> how realistic they were. And, you know, there's a couple good ones out there. But, yeah, those those shows you'd, I would always see when they sped up Kit driving yeah. through stuff and be like, lame. Like in the later years when he got the hyper, do you remember they had like hyper air brakes and hyper yes. boost stuff? And he'd have to be like, I'm calculating, Michael. <laughs> and he'd like have to figure out if he could like do 280 miles an hour through the traffic. And he'd just push the button and we're like, oh, yeah. That, that, Is that what goes through your head when you're calculating, mm -mm. when you're going to go down a ramp and go, uh, what was it, 332? 330, yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. yes. Yacht Is that what's going through your head, Kit? And yeah, Ryder calculating, and all of that and Michael. Calculating. <laughs> that would be weird. Well, yeah, that would be. <laughs> GTS Customs Corvette Specialists. Passion is the driving force behind every design, every build. Innovation taking the client's dream car places never thought possible. Not just seductive form, but flawless function, showcasing today's technology in yesterday's classic curves in luxury and in performance. Head over to highoctanehustle.com, shop the brand's page, and check out GTS Customs Corvette Specialists. Baja Forge, it isn't just the products and it's not just a brand, it's a way of life. At an early age, traveling to Baja was one of my fondest memories. It was about venturing to unknown destinations. It was the freedom of exploration and really slowing down to enjoy the amazing world and the people we have in it. Baja Forge is about helping you embrace adventure. Baja Forge, signature vehicle builds and off-road products built to forge your own path. Visit BajaForged.com today. How do you prep for something like that? I know. Take um, us through that. Right? At some point, you believe in the science. So at some point, you, you buy into the science, and, um, and you do that, you know, on paper and experientially. So we're jumping. We started with 165 feet. And Where you and I might start with 20. <laughs> it was for okay, this truck that, that wasn't Come a big on. deal. It was, you know, it was just like, it, it was a pretty, it was a, um, at the time, Lucas Off-Road series. You remember yeah. that series? Yes. So it was one of those trucks. They fly pretty good. Yeah. Um, so 165 feet wasn't really anything. They do that yeah. every lap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, <laughs> then you're kind of going bigger and bigger. And we had a ramp on a train track, basically, that we could move back. Mm. And going bigger and bigger. And... Then we would, uh, and we would make adjustments to suspension. We would cut holes in the hood and see what the arrow did. Perfect, so a lot yeah. of it was just exploration. We did more than 50 jumps in testing and learned a lot about how rebound affects the flight, which now people use in racing all the time. Then it really wasn't kind of figured out. Some of it applied from dirt biking. Some, mm -hmm. There were some good strategies there, but it was unknown if you, 
how to get the truck to fly right without getting air under the hood. Yep. I mean, do you want a really low cowling on the front or do you want to just cut the hood all out altogether? What happens when there's a crosswind and this and that? And so luckily little, you fly too. So that it was, I, it was after that, but yeah, it was a lot of learning. And I was thinking if we ever do this again, we're putting freaking wings on the thing <laughs> and, and doing it for real, but love it. It was, uh, we broke the world record 10 times in the testing, which was, I think, 301, it was, it was Greaves, it. Johnny Greaves had a record, 300 feet, and um, just kept pushing and pushing, and, and in, in our case, it couldn't be like a natural, I think his was kind of a jump that had a bit of a fall away, okay. so you could get the distance from this downward fall away without being 50 feet in the air. For Hot Wheels, it needed to look like your living room jump. Right. Where the truck is 50 feet in the air. So that that was the most sketchy part is there was no <laughs> coming up short, you know. Um, but it worked out. It was a big gag uh, on the day in at Indy 500. They were like at the last second, they're like, OK, we want to keep it secret who the yellow driver is. So um, <clears throat> you just got to come up with a story with while you're there at the Indy 500, because I, I knew some of the drivers and some of the teams. And the story was we were looking into doing a team to go to Vegas and do that race, which was like a $5 million purse type shootout. Yeah. And in the process of making up that story, I almost got a ride for that race. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it was pretty close. But the, you um, were that believable. Yeah. Good job. So yes, <laughs> acting. And, but ended up doing the, the, the thing. I mean, it was in front of 300,000 people. It was right at Gentlemen Start Your Engines. So they opened up the track to let all the teams bring their golf carts down to stand there and, and watch it happen, which was cool. And uh, landed and didn't die. And then everybody's like, okay, let's go race. <laughs> yeah, and that was, That's amazing. yeah, that was the thing. Yeah. But yeah, so she said, good. like prepping for something like that. How you you said it's it's science. It's I mean, do you kind of look at it like that? Like, okay, if this looks like a cool thing to do, then I'll do it. I mean, well, I mean, it's like there's this Excel spreadsheet thing where you literally put in the weight of the car, <laughs> the angle of the ramp, the speed, and it tells you the distance yeah. and how much force there is and its stuff. And it's I remember Ken Block used to carry this around, and whenever we did these like. Um, oh, you GRC. had this formula made yeah. already. He just okay. we'd, we'd go put a level on the ramp and literally a little digital level and he'd literally plug it in on his laptop and we'd see what speed you needed. And then we'd send Travis off in a, a dirt bike. <laughs> I love this. And with a radar gun. <laughs> okay. And then either Ken or myself would follow Travis in the car. Okay. Because you know, it was the exact same speed for yep. the car and the bike. And then everybody would do it. And you'd say, oh, it's 56 miles an hour and everybody would do it. So in in hot for the hot wheels jump we did that they they would say okay you're going to land exactly 180 feet on this one and then they were always within like two or three feet that's pretty good if i yeah. got the speed right they were always yeah. right there and so you started to build this faith in the science sure. and um was it kind of sketchy though like you said the first time <laughs> i'm just kind of let's yeah. go back to time number one where you're like mm, i don't know it was and the guy building the car billy hammond i don't know if you know billy mm -mm. jet boat billy um, he really I'm didn't for Marcel's hand on that. Uh, yeah. no, he, no. he really didn't, you know, he's the car builder. He doesn't want too much wear and tear on the thing. He wants the thing to be right, pack it up, go do the event. So we did 165 feet and there was a guy filming on the cell phone and you can hear a jet boat in the background. Don't get no better than that. Pack it up. So we put it in the truck, you know, and it's like we had 50 jumps to do. Yeah. He was, he was done, <laughs> but it, it's like for that thing, it's, uh, there were, there were problems to overcome, but you focus on those problems instead of the risk that is there. You knew where right? I was going with that. Yeah. What if I, hmm. Yeah. So it's like you're focusing on, okay, you've got GPS speed, but that works until the car goes up a little bit. And once it goes up, it sort of changes another, it puts another plane in the GPS calculation. And so then the speedo gets messed up for a moment. Uh, then you have wheel speed. So we had very sensitive wheel speed to a thousandth of a mile an hour. Wow. But when the car, when the truck hit the ramp, the tires compressed so yeah. much yep. that the wheel speed would ramp up. Yep. And so it took us a while to learn these things. Luckily, there was, we didn't have a major problem in that learning process. But by the end, you feel like you learned enough to get your head around what the limits really were. And there's and a cool factor there somewhere. Well, yes. 
Everything the, you do I mean, is kind of cool. Oh, you get to keep the helmet. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That's yeah. And I'm sure <laughs> you played with Hot Wheels when no, you were no, a kid. No, I did. Record, that. I mean. I did. So I used to watch this show, Tosh.0. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you remember? Yes. And funny. he he chimed in on the jump one time. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he said that. So uh, mainstream right there, huh? Yeah. So that was that was the cool factor. He, okay. he I think what he said was that. When you hit the mainstream like that. Yeah. 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 Comedy Channel. <laughs> he um, he called bullshit though because he said that if there, you know, if if it was toys for real, then a thirty foot golden retriever retriever would have caught it midair and <laughs> ran away, and, and ran away with it. <laughs> but it's That's tr- brilliant. Yeah. So true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was yeah no it's an amazing project. We followed that up with a loop, which I did with Greg Tracy, which was a double loop, and that was at the X Games. That was a world record. Also, it was six stories high. Yep. And that was a scarier stunt yeah. uh, because you couldn't start small. <laughs> yeah. The car could fall. We all played well, the Hot first Wheels. one did, the right? When you, they, you they were doing a. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. We thought the car would have to go super fast. They said 52 and a half miles. Yeah. An hour. And you're like, and that's like, not fast enough, yeah. is it? You're, we were I already know. That. Yeah. <laughs> Like who said that? And this engineer who was like 18 and a half years old <laughs> like, comes out. Like, yeah, you drive it all. <laughs> so we made them build us an electric uh, or a, an RC version, yeah, like a remote control car. And they came out. It was a full size car. Had this like remote control guy, and uh, he went up, and the car fell out of the loop. Oh yeah, and yeah, exploded. Yeah, yeah. And tires like <laughs> bounced down. This was it. Like, yeah, yeah. Hello. Greg and I just looked <laughs> yeah. at each other, and they're like, "That's this our only a one." Good idea. <laughs> so Greg went good, first. Because I'm the only one too. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. They, then they put a net. At one point, they actually put a net in there okay. for the testing, and, and they it fell through it. They put a car up there, and they let it go, and it bounced once, and the net all unhooked itself, yeah. and then it came uh, crashing I'm like, That's down. That's not gonna hold it. Yeah. Um, Airbag. Like no, no, never even got that far. Oh, I Christmas. I had one of those little Traxxas trucks. Uh, yeah. I forget what they were, a slasher? Was that what it was called? It went 60. You remember that one? Yeah. And it was the first thing to go through the loop. And it, it looked impossible when it hit it, and it went right through. Everybody erupted. It was like, yeah! It was like, you know, as if we'd done the deal. You're like, right? that thing weighs like uh, 10 pounds, 20 well, pounds? Well, <laughs> at that point, Mattel we'll had there. spent... Let's figure it out. <laughs> I don't know what they... They had they'd invested a lot into this, sure. and everybody's getting the feeling like, oh my gosh, this may not happen. Sure. And so then Greg and I rock, paper, scissored. He, I can't remember if he won or lost, but he went first, which meant he got to win on the day because one car had to get the lead, essentially. And he went and did the deal, and uh, there wasn't, yeah, there were some bad mishaps in testing <laughs> that were, um, but the car broke every time. So you didn't do one where the car came out completely fine. It was wow. 6.8 Gs on the car when it hit yeah. the ramp. We had to go up in a plane and do 7G testing and um, it just to figure out how to not black out. For you, yourself, yeah. Yeah, and the and the problem with it, it was it was zero to 6.8 instantly. Instead of like building in a plane where you could kind of hold sure. some of the blood in, it just drained instantly. So, um, so how do you train for that? Just <clears> plane? You just learn how much you have to, how much kind of red face and squeezing so your eyeballs are almost popping out you need before you kind of gray out a little bit i know it sounds weird it's the <laughs> the things you do Thinking right that's, yeah that's, that's how you train how, that. how it, insecure okay. do you have to be in your industry to do that just to keep a job well i'm not doing that, <laughs> I'm doing that. no it's it, it was fun the process was fun i loved airplanes and and everything yeah. but you have to start with your toes and your calves and quad and butt and gut and just start squishing the blood up as hard as you can really you hold the steering Did wheel you wear compression socks no. or any type of Mm-mm. wow no and that huh. would only help you it would only buy you a g or so it doesn't help <laughs> it doesn't help you a lot is it, but isn't one g better so you, than no g? yeah you it prep is yourself so. before going into yeah it when you're on the straightaway it. yeah you'd be going you're on the rev limiter okay. 52 and a half miles an hour you'd be in second gear you had a hand throttle that you would push it basically you lock a thing that pushes the pedal down so okay. if your foot slips off it stays full throttle okay then you put <laughs> that's then when you black out they want to Oh, yeah, and yeah. Your foot slips okay. off. You hopefully wake up before that, you know the <laughs> aftermath. Right. But so then you have a, both hands on the wheel at the bottom okay. in case one slips off. It doesn't turn the wheel. Okay. And then you get going uh, with all the blood going to your face, and it looks like you're just hitting a wall. 
because it's not yeah. like a roller coaster where it's like a big radius at first and then it tightens up at the top of the loop and then goes big. It's a circle like the toy. Yeah. So it yeah. just, it's a, it's a <laughs> it's spike. It's a toy. You were the toy. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. I felt like the toy. And I felt like it was payback because I put my sister's little pet mouse that she had on my remote control car one time. <laughs> oh. And I felt like this was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was and the does payback. does your sister know that or does oh, she yeah, know it now? No, no, she's still pissed. Yeah. So, um, the mouse didn't survive? No, he survived. Oh, are you kidding? Oh, no, I didn't okay. murder the mouse. Okay. I just well, gave I him a sure ride. Where it was going. I, I didn't have sure. a driver's license. I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if? And I thought I, I thought I was doing him a favor, you know, yeah. letting him. So now we know it. you did test explore. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, that was you your tested test. Mal- mice when you were young. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That was> good. <laughs> so, where this all came from? Okay. So <laughs> it, uh, yeah, you did. You, you. It, ideally, you'd be one G at the top. Okay. Right, because that's the same gravity we're getting right now. So that's just enough to keep the tires on the on the ground, as it were. And then and, it starts all over again. And then it goes back up to 6.8. So we would, um, we put white paint on the top. If you ever watch the video, you'll see white stripes at oh, the top. We're watching it now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you, so you see the white, and when you saw the white um, paint, you'd take the throttle off, and you could let go of the throttle and even start riding the brake on the way down just to minimize the G hit on the way down and then back to full throttle for the jump. But every time, oh, God, there's a jump. oh yeah, no, six stories upside down but no, was there's not more. enough. I feel like this is one of those nice But wait, there's nice, more. Nice yeah. Infomercials, but wait. There's and more. there's two cars, not just one car. You get two for the price of one. Yeah. No, it was, um, yeah, it, it, we tested yeah. it three times. Every time something broke, um, the second time was the scariest for me because I, I bottomed out the nose into mm. the ramp and, and my head got stuck on my Hans device straps at six G's and I was looking at my lap and I couldn't see because oh, there's a little turn you have to do. Oh, snap. And so I kind of did the little bit of a turn and kind of guessed at it. And then at the top, I could get my head back. And, oh, wow. And that one was Whoa. pretty scary. But uh, Greg and I both were like, you know what? That's enough testing. We did it three times. Let's just pack it up. They had to dismantle the whole thing from El Toro, um, you know, in Orange County, drive it up to L.A. and rebuild it. And then then we did it on the day. But that was um, yeah, that was those were amazing marketing efforts. And the goals that met, I think I learned from Mattel, their goals were like, hey, we're going to go do something next in China. And our goal is one toy per, per kid average in the country. And that was like a billion kids or something. Uh, more than that actually and at a dollar per that was going to be like two or three billion dollars worth of sales and like that's how they mapped it out so greg and i asking x dollars to go do it you know some drivers would come in there and be like yeah i do that for free just to be a part of it kind of a thing but you know you had to kind of get a value and understand they're going to be selling three billion dollars worth of stuff off of this definitely and use it as, you know, as part of their whole marketing thing. Obviously, it wasn't yeah. the only thing they were going to do to break into that market. But, yeah, so the, the business side of it was good. But the science side was mixed with scary. Uh, <laughs> he yeah. finally said it. There's a little bit of scary in there. Oh, no. A it was, little it was bit. Scary. Okay. It was scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, both of those were. Did you pick up the bong after that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was wondering when the bong was going to come around. And, <laughs> You're like, please pass it. I, I would have. I need a moment, please. Yeah. At that point, I was racing in Europe oh. full time, and they tested for everything. So that was, that was long gone. Yeah. That yeah. Is. I was getting haircuts just so they didn't like, do, do like well, hair shake sample. My head. Yeah, Brittany. exactly. Well, you know, and I was telling Jane earlier that just recently, you know, because you're stunt driving and things like that, I mean, hey, you got to sit uh, next to Keanu Reeves and teach him how to drive too. Yeah, movies are cool because you get to pretend and do stuff like that and, and act, I think, with the cars. Those are the fun ones for me. I mean, real bona fide stunt people come in and they do the huge cannon thing where they hit a button and a cannon shoots out of the bottom of the car and flips it up in the air and then they, <laughs> while they're upside oh down, gosh. they hit another button and flames go off in it and then they wow. ram into a train. You know, But before that happens with all the technical driving and drifting that leads up to the crash, that's okay. the part that I do. And that I enjoy. Okay. Sometimes you're in Fast and Furious movies, you're playing a character where driving is kind of part, either part of their skill or they don't have skills. Yeah. So they're having to yeah. fake one way or the other. Yeah. 
Um, John Wick is an interesting one because they he uses everything as a weapon. If he finds a coffee cup or whatever, he's going to kill somebody with it. Anything he looks at, you know, is going to be a weapon. And so when he gets in a car, he's got to come up with like creative ways to kill people with the car. It's awful, <laughs> but that's the nature of that beast. And um, he uh, that whole process started. I got a call from a stunt coordinator that I'd worked with in. My first movie, which was Dukes of Hazard, in nice. 2005, the stunt coordinator on that one, Scott Rogers, and he was like, hey, we just want to go up to Willow Springs with Keanu and just get in some cars and see, you know, just have some fun and see, see what he remembers from training and other stuff cool. and what we can teach him in three Driving days. Driving buses just like you? Yes. <laughs> when he was a ski bum in Vail, which I wouldn't doubt, actually. Um, so we took cars, actually, from this shop, shop across the alley. Um, from Dennis McCarthy, he brought some muscle cars up and we spent three days doing it. We came up with six things and we kind of pieced them together in a little sequence and filmed them with a little handheld stuff, holding a GoPro in the passenger seat and stuff like that. And they ended up showing that to Lionsgate. Lionsgate greenlit the, the movie and then they wrote the script after that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's, it's reverse process, but sometimes Very you get cool. the actor. It's, you yeah, gotta I was going to say, it's when you're Keanu it. Reeves, yeah. you get to write your own Love script. Love it. Yeah. yeah, so they wrote those six moves into the chase scene. Yeah. So that movie, for me, was a weird one, because I, I always train the actors to a certain extent, but that's so that they can make sure they're looking the right direction or doing something realistic with the steering wheel. Yeah. When you see me driving or somebody else, and it cuts to them in a fake car. Yep. Um, but with Keanu, he actually did the driving. That's cool. Yeah. And so then they could rip the doors off, windshield out, make yeah. sure you could light him so you could see his feet hitting the, the, the rear brake, you know, the parking brake kind of a thing and, and doing all the moves and struggling at it, which is part of John Wick is he kind of, he's tired as hell. He's been, it's been right. eight straight hours of being right? shot at, right? <laughs> We've all seen a John Wick movie, right? Yeah. It's just constant. Yeah. When does yeah. it slow down? Poor guy it doesn't no. catch a break. <laughs> no. Interesting tidbit about that movie was that you know you only have so many stunt guys and women, so they would start with long hair, and then as the movie went on, they just keep getting haircuts shorter and shorter, <laughs> so they could be reused over and over and and get killed <laughs> off again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, didn't know that part. Yeah. Nor yeah. did I. That's, well, our time has gone way yeah. too fast, but what so what else do you have? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> we it loved it. Too many laughs, laughs here and uh, snorts, too. I mean. <laughs> okay, one snort, you guys. I know, in the first one 30 snort. seconds. It's not bad. Almost a spit take, but... <laughs> We didn't quite get that bad, but, you know. Yeah. But uh, what, what else do you have going on right now? I mean... I mean, I race uh, Extreme E for McLaren, which that, is a... Didn't even get into I know about that. Well, we which know is kind of it's an off-road we yep. thing yeah. it's not american style off-road it's very european style yes. where they're rally raid trucks like yep. perry dakar type racing double wishbone instead of huge trailing links that's so the, awesome so they're it, not it looks like star wars watching it it's they're crazy insane. they're really fast yeah they're really heavy yeah and they don't have they have like 10 12 <clears throat> inches of travel so in the oh. back so they're it's not <laughs> something that like I said, over here, Baja or American nope. style, we're yeah. used to having quite a lot more off-road capability. Yep. Maybe less handling. They're, they they drive like a rally car, but yeah. um, they can't take a hit nearly as well as they should be able to. But McLaren, it's it's a it's a fascinating door for me because yeah. it's a lot of, you know, in my world where I race for manufacturers, I see the biggest competitor to raising money for racing is YouTube or just straight content. Yeah. So if you're going to spend X millions on racing versus that same number on content, right. They almost always choose the content. They, they can tell their own story. They never lose. Uh, you know, they, they get to control it. The agency gets to actually spend that money and make money on it where the racing, it all goes, they could lose. You never know what the story is going to be. So it's, it's really difficult where um, Extreme E is doing a nice job of keeping a different angle of motorsport. Yeah, in what country is it in? Uh, it's so all over. Knows. The next one's in, in Italy, Sardinia on yeah. the island. Most, and mostly uh, Europe, Saudi, Europe and, yeah, Middle and East. South America. So then okay. the one after that's in Chile. Cool. And then they're trying to get a, a race in the U.S. I think it would be in Montana maybe for next year. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. But... Very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a couple years old now that they've been doing it. So it's a couple years old. Yeah. They have an, a, you know, they're not trying to save, save the world, but they do a couple things unlike other 
racing series, like everybody in the paddock brings their own cutlery. So there's no plastic bottles or disposable oh. cups in, on the paddock. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody uses inflatable uh, uh, shops. So the shops are engineered and everything and they're this size, you know, pretty big size, but they're all inflatable so they can all collapse and they go on a ship and it all travels together to Very the next cool. race instead of yeah. each team bringing their own stuff. Yeah. And so the footprint is made smaller by just a couple of these things Neat. that make enough of a story that the manufacturers are like, oh, this has an interesting, like future proof motorsport story. Yeah. So then they, they stay involved. So for me, I'm all, I mean, I believe that racing has helped us live for a hundred years now we right. have seat belts and disc brakes and all the things we take for granted came from racing i hope that innovation doesn't stop and so that's one of my later missions is is to try to keep motorsport future proof because i cool. made a great living doing it and we all have fun doing it so it'd be nice to continue love that can i ask our last question please yeah. alive or dead <laughs> that's always a good start <laughs> who would who would you like to sit and have a meal with oh, and a conversation with that i I'm not sure. Prepared to, <laughs> you are not prepared to answer. I'm not prepared to I answer that one. I didn't bring the science. No. Um, I think uh, Carl Sagan. Wow. Yeah. Um, and just, just because, I mean, I read, I started school as an aerospace engineer before going into molecular. And it, and just, I, so I read his book, the Bang, Big Bang there the first three minutes, you know, books about how he thought the universe started and um, his, his perspective, on, perspective on life. And still I see him quoted in documentaries and stuff, yeah. even on Netflix. And, and it, you can tell his perspective is just so macro that it just makes so much sense. Yeah. That the, the logic is just kind of more pure than anybody can come up with who's biased from the inside of an industry. He's just seeing it from so far away, it just makes total sense to him, you know. So, I'd, yeah, I'd love to feed off of that a little bit. Great answer. Yeah, yeah that was a good answer. I, like I liked that. it. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Wow, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> it went way too fast. Way Sorry, too fast. I a Thanks lot. for flying down. Of course. You know, yes. come, come My pleasure. I hope you'll do it again. Yes, I think that definitely. there's so many things that we have. Did not touch can, on. Yes, that we can continue to talk about since you're only, what, 10, 15 minutes away? 12. 12 yeah, on a right. plane from I his house. <laughs> Wait, oh, there was one thing I wanted to uh, mention. Um, the vehicle that you have in your house Oh, that you stare at from your bathroom. Oh, I don't want to say stare, but <laughs> it just stare. gets creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a 912E. We've, we've broached that. <laughs> yeah. We're beyond that. Glance, yeah. is that better? Glance, lovingly glance? Yeah, yes, 100%. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's a 912V, 1976. My dad bought it right when my parents got divorced. I think it was like, I don't know, what, what is that midlife crisis thing? I don't know. I was just going to yeah. ask, so yeah. that might have been his midlife crisis. Yeah, so he got it. It's a car that kind of got me into cars. I mean, I not kind of, it genuinely did. But um, he, I grew up with it in the garage and always thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then uh, my little brother and sister were kind of killing it when they started to learn to drive. And so I finally convince my dad to sell it to me and then yeah I've had it out here in California ever since um when and my my rally co-driver Chrissy designed my house and she put a lift in it where it sits up in the second floor and it's it's kind of a, a it was started as a storage area and it's turned into a like a shrine but it's you know there's a little incense in there with the car um, and yoga mats and stuff. You gotta, <laughs> it's, a, no. it's gotta have good juju. <laughs> no, it's Otherwise, not you quite don't get like behind that. the wheel of the car. Yeah. It's pretty cool to see that, though. I'm not gonna that lie. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. I'm very fortunate to be to still have that car. Yeah. It's like the slowest Porsche ever made, <laughs> but it's um, you know something that I could never even. I don't even know the value of it. it uh, it's not something I'd ever sell. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I think that wraps it up. I mean, yes. you know, we, yeah. we all have a vehicle like that. I mean, we talked about cars. We look at them lovingly. That's why we're all here. That's yes. Right. That is right. <laughs> Gently give them little pets here yes. and there with wax. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for following along with Tanner. I'm Fastlane Jane, and this has been High Octane Hustle. And I'm Design Muse, and we had Tanner. All right. Better. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You. Thank you guys. Oh Appreciate it. Thank you. That was great. Thanks.
pleasantly yes. surprised. So you did drink the worm then? That's a thing. No. <laughs> no. 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 Oh. They were dried crickets. They were, or they were they dried, were dried oh, they worms. They were smashed up. up so it's like salt. Yeah. But it's smashed up worms that is like, tastes like salt. Oh. Yeah. I mean, they, it's It was not. very so good, he, but he it was foreign He brought us some very uh, ethnic type stuff. So, but so, it was fantastic. I mean, if you know that about the bugs, then you must know why there's... And this is a question. I don't know the answer, but I got asked the question literally yesterday. Okay. Why is there salt on the rim? Oh, I think to cut the... Tequila? Sweetness. Yeah, and the taste. Well, <laughs> the so taste. we did it with orange. I know. I know. We I think it, it is. Orange. I mean, it's the same thing with like a pickle or something like that. Oh, like I think pickle it juice. Takes away, I see. Yeah, yeah, it takes away that bitterness or, you know, alcohol flavor, I guess. Okay. But um, the so stuff we did we were oranges. We did the crushed up salt worms. Worm and salt. then we did crickets. Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> with mezcal. <laughs> You would it's do not it. that kind of show. It was just it's with good. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're going to cut the alcohol, it's going to be so you don't like spontaneously vomit. But then <laughs> if you're chewing a bug, it seems like crunching a cricket. And it, it's not. I, I'm a big yeah. wussy. And you chewed I, that puppy up. I did. Pick the I leg was, out of your tooth. No, you didn't even it. need to do that. It was, it was really strange. So you like to explore a lot of different uh, food is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well I mean, <laughs> I am I have not eaten the cricket. Okay. Uh, I don't well, know if that's a cat. There's like two types of people in this world, I guess. <laughs> we need to introduce and you I, to our friend, Matt Martelli. Yeah, he is one well, that mezcal, has. Yeah. Yeah. Mezcal Matt. Mezcal. <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. I like that. That's actually pretty good. I think so, too.